there were footprints and cane torches and yeah those are, are also present the footprints are relatively rare compared to the amount of cane torches or 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 uh, dried poop if you go down to Jaguar Cave, uh, there was a whole reach of one passage in which there were footprints of probably 12 or, uh, or more uh, paleo people. <laughs> and there were some grass slippers in the cave as well. Yeah. And, uh, some of that was collected by Ezra Pound, who was an early archaeologist who collected a bunch of stuff out of uh, Salt's Cave. And these slippers were woven uh, out of uh, kind of reeds that you find along the Green River still. You wanted, got a certificate of merit from the NSS in, I think, in 1957 for your caving exploits, I guess. Do you remember that? Yes. I'm trying to remember what for. I, I won a number of prizes. One was the Pete Hauer History Prize. And We'll just skip that. You wrote a, a paper um, when they had the uh, Max Camper oh, Symposium, yeah. Mapping of Mammoth Cave, How Cartography Fuel Discoveries. Well, how does topography relate to uh, your discoveries? How does all that work? Well, when we discovered that vertical shafts lined up under re-entrance and valley edges and went to pole with that information, and he had found out the same relationship 20 years before, uh, we began to see the utility of looking at the topography in relation to the cave, because not only were vertical shafts found there, but very often horizontal passages would terminate and break down at the valley walls. And that if you found a way under the valley, you could come up into a continuation of the same passage. That led to a paper that I wrote called uh, Terminal Breakdowns and uh, Anyway, these passages once continued through the now hilly topography, uh, showing that there was a surface above the present surface, and that these drainage tubes, these upper level bigger passages, extended all the way back to the sinkhole plain, uh, and as far as into the base of the knobs. So you've got these passages at a certain level, and yeah. then there are surface erosion in these Truncate. dry valleys, truncates them, and you get yeah. breakdown at the end of these passages. Right. And so... Truncated passages and terminal breakdowns, that was the title of it. Then you, uh, to find a way underneath it, then you go to find these vertical shafts. Right. And you go down a level, and then you find another horizontal. All shafts have drains, but it isn't just the active drain. They have abandoned drains on the way down to where the active drain is now. So if you get into a vertical shaft, you can go up and find uh, remnant abandoned drains and go someplace 
Well, as you go toward the valley, you run into a breakdown again. And maybe the, down on the bottom, you get the drain goes into an underground stream and you can go right under the valley. That was, uh, that was our first direct evidence that we were going to hook this crystal cave to Mammoth Cave because we had uh, gone under uh, some pretty deep valleys on the bottom level when the intermediate and upper levels were broken down. So we knew then that we had room under Houchins Valley, uh, you know, maybe 150 feet of rock from the valley bottom to down to the Green River level to uh, go under. And uh, then when we began to connect caves through these drains, uh, we saw how the whole thing fitted together and that the drains that were up at the upper level tend to migrate downward in echelon, lower and lower until the active drain is down on the bottom. Well, the active drain has no relationship at all to the topography. It'll go under valleys and under uplands and everything else, uh, generally leading toward the Green River, which is the master stream. Now, one of the uh, recent discoveries is that this base level, which we find here and there in the cave, if you get into it, generally you could walk in the water just fine. But when you come to Roaring River and Mammoth Cave, through which in 1938 they found the new discovery section of Mammoth Cave, there are some 40-foot blue holes in the middle of the Roaring River that go down into this cave system underneath everything that uh, by and large is unknown. <laughs> so there are a lot of things to be discovered and described yet at Mammoth Cave, including this flooded lower level which is not accessible except through cave diving. And you should make clear to people who are not from a karst region that these valleys like Houchins valleys and all that aren't ones with active streams on the surface because the water's been captured. Right? Been captured. So these are topographic valleys as opposed to, as opposed to active streams. That's exactly Street right. Valleys. And if you tramp along the bottom of the Talwig, you know, it turns out it's not a nice Talwig, it's a bunch of sinkholes all connected. Uh, so you have a, a lot of relief in the bottom of the valleys. However, the topographic pattern, if you look at it on the map, is clearly a dendritic drainage, drainage surface drainage pattern, uh, which when it broke through to the soluble rocks, uh, they captured all of the drainage in the valley. and Suddenly the valley was a very slow developing uh, valley, except for the walls of the valley where large uplands would drain through vertical shafts and erode the valley walls. Uh, So the combination of vertical solution and vertical transport uh, plus the horizontal solution and transport developed a cave system in a relatively few million years. And the, the extent of the cave system is still largely unknown. Back in about 19, well, back in about uh, the 1990s, uh, Bowling Green was wanted to develop a, a large industrial park called the Trans Park on top of the 
Graham Springs Basin across from Bowling Green. Uh, we formed an organization called uh, KEEP, K-E-E-P, for Karst uh, Environmental Education and Protection, which was incorporated to specifically fight the transport. And at that time, uh, my uh, argument was that the Transpark was planning to use the same kind of drainage that Bowling Green used. They, for years and years, they just dumped all the sanitary sewage down into the karst, and uh, till one day when a filling station tank leaked into the karst and it blew up. Uh, a lot of the city sewer system, uh, that's when they recognized this was not a cheap solution for sanitary sewage disposal. Uh, well, they planned to develop this transport with injection wells, which is really nothing but a, a well down into the underground uh, karst to get rid of wastewater, whether it's industrial wastewater or runoff from s streets or whatever. And my concern was that since these basins spill over, if you get a big rain from down near Bowling Green, it's going to back water up into the Graham Spring Basin and spill over into the Mammoth Cave Basin. The basins are very shallow. and they're totally in, interconnected above the present water level because of the whole nature of these, this cave system. Well, I tangled in a big way with uh, Dr. Crawford. Dr. Crawford was uh, my champion for many years. He had me teach the speleology course and he built the rest of the offerings around that course because every year 20 or 30 people would take this course and really get turned on to uh, cave exploring and understanding caves from the standpoint of the evidence because we spend a lot of time looking at the evidence and looking at the exceptions to the evidence so, so they can not be fooled and carried away by uh, a hasty assumption. So anyway, Crawford maintained that the basins uh, were self-contained and couldn't possibly spill over and I said they could and cited some of Quinlan's evidence that they not only could spill over uh, in high water times but they could spill over regularly as Quinlan's uh, Madison Spring example flowing both ways in low water. Well all of the dye tracing is done during low water. It's never done during high water. Why is that? Well because people don't like to go outdoors when you get these heavy rains and dump a bunch of dye in a sinkhole somewhere and get all wet and muddy doing that. They only put dye in sinkholes uh, during nice, dry, sunny weather. Uh, don't do stuff you don't have to do. Well, <laughs> so anyway, they built the Transpark. They were going to put an airport on top of it, move the airport away from the developing part of the city and get the government to build them another airport on a sinkhole plane. Well, they hired some fancy geologists who said, uh, you're going to try to put runways on top of sinkholes? That'll never work. You're going to crash the airplane. And so the air, airport disappeared from the plan. And uh, since I I've taught marketing at the university for 25 years. I've never had a marketing course, but 
in the course of doing industrial advertising, I had to figure out how marketing worked in order to figure right. out how to apply the advertising. At Wright State? But yeah, at Wright State I taught marketing for, taught most of the courses in the department, even though I was totally unqualified to teach. But uh, I'm a pretty good storyteller and I had reduced uh, marketing to five or ten basic principles and if you could teach people that they would be able to handle about 95 percent of the marketing problems they ran into. The other five percent, two and a half percent, the company was going to go bankrupt no matter what they did. And in the other case you needed to find somebody smarter than you as an expert to help. <laughs> You're talking about using the karst as a sewage drain. Yeah. Would you like to mention an example like at Horse Cave, Kentucky? Oh yeah, that's a classic example. Well, tell us something about it because you're talking to whoever's watching this video instead of to me. <laughs> well, Horse Cave, Kentucky was probably the first spectacular example of the pollution of a, of a cave by a, a dairy operation that uh, dumped the whey and uh, byproducts of the dairy operation down a sinkhole in their backyard and it, it entered uh, the, the <coughs> a horse cave system and made it absolutely impossible to uh, run uh, cave trips into that system. So the Hidden River Cave System uh, is one of those systems that was uh, drained by the retreating Green River after it made Mammoth Cave. And uh, so all of, it's out on the sinkhole plain and all of the surrounding sinkholes go into Hidden River Cave. So when the creamery dumped all its uh, waste products into the cave, the whole cave became polluted, began to stink so that you couldn't uh, go in the cave, really. Later on, there was a propane leak into Hidden River Cave and uh, a party was in that cave with uh, their uh, carbide lamps and uh, the, the, they were suddenly surrounded by a, 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 an explosion of propane set off by the carboid, carbide lamps. So that cave uh, was owned still by the Thomas family and uh, they were also prohibited from using the cave because it went under the railroad and the railroad didn't want to have to pay for a collapse into the cave that might injure people. So they forbid uh, the tourist operation. But that was the first and most notorious pollution of uh, karst. Uh, there have been many other instances since. Uh, out in Missouri, for example, uh, classic case uh, in which uh, one of these springs which puts out a million gallons a day uh, showed uh, traces of perchlorate which is a dry cleaning fluid. Turns out it was dumped into a sinkhole by a dry cleaner 35 miles away. Well the cave is a conduit, it doesn't filter anything. It's just like having a pipe going from wherever you put stuff in to where you are affected by it. So a karst is bad news when it comes to pollution, when it comes to collapse, uh, and uh, it could be a hazard to everybody, the developer and the people who are trying to find drinking water as well. 
Hidden River Cave quality, the water has improved dramatically in the last 20 years since the putting in of a regional sewage treatment system. Yes. And uh, some education on not to dump things down sinkholes. And it's currently being run by the American Cave Conservation Association. Yes. And uh, can you think of another cave that's come back from being polluted as bad as Hidden River has? I can't think of one except all of the caves under Bowling Green, and that would include Hidden River Cave, uh, probably Luster. remnants of that many years long pollution Duration. I I know I toured uh, Bowling Green one day with somebody who was knowledgeable about this, and there are sinkholes all over town. Some places where buildings are slumping and uh, collapse is a very real factor in Bowling Green. Uh, Dishman Lane was a, a place where. Uh, there was already a map of something called State Trooper Cave, uh, which was a kind of a single long conduit. Uh, and uh, they consulted uh, Dr. Crawford about where to put the road over that cave, and he showed a nice crossing in it as a you know, you come down and then you cross it at right angles and then you continue. They decided that was too much money, so they just ran the <laughs> road right along the cave. Well, they suddenly the cave began, the road above the cave began to sink. And letters appeared in the paper saying, the road is sinking, something ought to be done about it. And somebody said, oh, that's just the compaction of the road. The contractor failed to adequately compact the road bed. I wrote a letter to the paper saying it's going to collapse. They got Crawford on the horn and he said no it's probably the compaction of the road bed. Well he had warned them not to do what they did. And then one day bang the whole thing goes down and it swallows uh, a couple of cars and a truck and puts Dishman Lane out of commission for a long time. It cost a couple of million dollars to fill it up and when they they did they they didn't consult anybody who knew about karst. But here is this passage that was maybe 10 feet high and 25 feet wide that would flow pipe full. You knew that because of the shrubbery and branches and stuff jammed into the roof. So when they began to, they dug out this sinkhole, they put down a couple of rows of two foot tile and then filled in on top of it. Well, guess what? You've built the biggest dam in this conduit that flows pipe full, uh, what do you think will happen to it when the water backs up behind these two conduits? Because the conduits should have been at least the cross section of the original passage. Otherwise you're going to back up water for miles. Well sure enough, Dishman Lane is starting to sink again. And I, people have said, oh, that's a Brucker again. But it's not Brucker again, it's sinking again. Because they didn't bother to think about what it would take to really fix that. You'd have to build a bridge over the thing. And uh, <laughs> still it might break out someplace else. They had the uh, Corvette Museum in Bowling Green. What's that? They had the Corvette Museum incident in Bowling Green. Yes, that collapsed too. That was part of this whole 
Graham Spring's orientation of the, the major cave system before there was a mammoth cave? There's a lot of names I recognize looking over the early history of the NSS and probably when it was first, uh, you're first into it, you probably, it was a smaller organization but uh, did you know like, uh, was it Charles Moore? Yeah, I knew Charles. And uh, I knew Tom Polson myself. Yes, I know Tom Polson very well. And William Davies. Yes, I know William Davies. And uh, who else? There's Brother Nicholas Sullivan, did you? Yes, he was one of our earliest supported uh, scientists in which he was doing a study on cave crickets. And what he decided was do cave crickets migrate around in a cave or do they stay in one place? So he was getting his PhD, I think. Uh, so we sat down and talked about the whole problem. So we marked the cave off in bands. The cave was very short. It was about 70 feet long, maybe. And we divided it into meter wide bands and uh, hired a guy, a science teacher, to ride his bicycle over there and every day and count the cave crickets in each band. Well, the cave crickets were marked with nail polish dots. So we had individual cave crickets identifiable by the dot number of dots and the colors of the dots. So he could record in an hour or two which cave crickets were in which bands. So we got a call one day <laughs> and uh, he was in a panic. He said, the, the crickets are gone. And we said, what do you mean gone? He said, they're not there. <laughs> we told, we called up Brother Nicholas and told him that the crickets are gone. And he said, well, maybe they'll come back. So we sent the guy back into the thing after a few days and they were all back in the cave. Well, it turns out that subsequent studies have shown that when the outside conditions are close to the in interior of the cave conditions, that is about 55 degrees, uh, and they are relative humidity is about the same. The cave crickets go outside and forage in the forest, and then they come back in to the cave. So they were all outside foraging while he went in to do the census, and uh, thus he was surprised when they left and surprised when they came back. So that's Brother Nicholas' story. What 